Good evening. It's currently um, 12.43 in Spain, um, 7.43 in, in London. I've been asked to, to state the date and the time by some of the listeners. I do believe it is, let me just check, it's the 17th, Sunday the 17th of April 2016. My name is Herschel36. This is Truth, Truth is Strange and the Fiction. And my word, have we got... Um, someone on um, this interview for you, <laughs> everyone wants to listen to. Amazing guy. Uh, we have Crow777. Crow777, how are you? Hey, man, how are you? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. It's 2.44 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the United States. Man, how goes it? Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. We're, we're, uh, I'm currently sitting in my, my little place, uh, Crow, in, in uh, just on the Mediterranean, and uh, we are coming more and more into into summertime which I, I love winter in the mountains and when i'm by the beach i love uh, summertime um i, I really do so, so that's really nice but i could tell you before we get cracking that they the governments are chemtrailing they're chemtrailing and they're chemtrailing and it's driving me insane we used to have perfectly blue skies and now we have got particles of uh, metals being dropped from from planes and no one seems to 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 uh, mind about that i know you i you are I, I know i've seen footage of you filming chemtrails i use my iphone and i i i film the chemtrails and i post it on facebook and then people tell me i'm a, i'm an absolute freak um but have you got any comment a small comment on chemtrails yeah, it's uh, it's out of hand now. Of course, I recently moved from California to the state of Rhode Island. Here, what we see is every single day that the sun comes up and it's going to be a blue sky. Uh, the chem planes fly across the ecliptic, which is the apparent path of the sun and moon, and uh, they block things out. Uh, but what's actually very telling about this is for the average person that becomes aware, it's one thing to understand that even the air you breathe is being assaulted um, and the sun that you need to survive is being blocked, among other things. But the majority of the population seems to be in a sleepy spell where they just can't catch on that this is not normal. And here in the United States, I've lived on both coasts now. Uh, in the last couple of years, I can tell you the weather patterns do not resemble uh, what I remember from my younger years. I agree with you, and I was commenting on that earlier today to a friend of mine because I grew up as a kid. You know, when I was ten, I was um, playing in the back garden of my parents' house in in Hampshire, which down in the south of England, and, and we used to ride our bicycles through through the trees. And you know, it sounds very idyllic, you know. And of course, it was. I was very fortunate, you know, middle class kind of upbringing. But of course, my parents took took me to Christian church, you know, the, the Catholic church. Sorry, and we, you know, we're, we're not talking about that today. But that's another whole conversation itself. But I swear to you, we had these round puffy um round puffy clouds and there weren't uh, trails coming out of the back of airplanes no um and um we, we we do have a busy here in malaga we've got a busy uh, skyline because we've got a very busy airport but i can tell you that i've got something called a flight tracker on my phone and i put the flight tracker up and they're not commercial flights um you know and yeah, i lose heart a little bit because i get so much abuse about chemtrails, you know, because I, I, I feel it's my duty to bring this to people's attention. Because w what's, what's in these chemtrails, do you think, Crow? Well, I, you know, we can look at uh, lab reports that have taken place apparently all over the world, and we know for a fact that there's at least three heavy metals which show up in almost everything we've seen. Um, at the moment, I've forgotten, I guess it's uh, barium... Uh, I haven't thought about this for a while. Some kind of an aluminum. Aluminum. And, uh, strontium. Is strontium. it strontium? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think those are them. But, uh, you know, it's it's even gotten so bad that uh, uh, maybe three years ago I had read a report where they were doing water quality tests on Lake Hot Tahoe on the west coast of the United States. Um, and they were finding high levels of these things. Um, you know, there are people beginning to draw a line to the Alzheimer's and everything else because um, apparently some of these metals in high dose have some really ill effects on the human body. But, you know, it's almost like the real problem at this point 
uh, or the, the biggest problem is not that they're spraying, but that there are so many people that are completely in a daze, just completely living in a dream state and have no clue. And even when you try to inform them, they can't accept what's right in front of their face. Well, that is the really frustrating thing. Um, a friend of mine also over the weekend told me that um, um, she just said, listen, Dave, I'm, I'm worried about you. Um, you know, you should get a hobby, she told me. And I'm, I'm really active, you know, <laughs> I do a lot of stuff. And I just, I just let it, you know, because she was referring to my, my need for, for, for the truth, you know, because I, I believe that we live in a construct. No, you're spot on. Um, it's not only a construct, but there actually are some very old cultures, apparently, on the planet um, that have a link uh, to ancient information that most of the modern societies don't have access to if they ever did. Uh, and the, uh, the aboriginal or so-called aboriginal communities of Australia, um, people should look into the dream time, which is what they call this waking life. Um, they could learn a lot from the aboriginal people. Well, that's really interesting because um, my research leads me to believe that the white man will go into um, an area, um, a tribal area, whether it's Aboriginal or in Africa, as an example, and that they will locate the leader with the knowledge. They'll, they will, they will take the knowledge and learn from from the leader, and then kill the person with the knowledge. And I think this has been going on for, you know, centuries. And um, I, I, I would, I would even like to hasten to add that a lot of that knowledge may be found in the uh, library underneath the Vatican. <laughs> Well, it's hard to know what's there, but it's, you know, it's very telling in itself when you have a, li a library that stretches back as far as that library does, and it's not open to the public. Um, that tells you just about everything you need to know. Well, I spent thousands of hours documenting and filming, both with a telescope and a very high-powered telephoto lens on the west coast of the United States and California. Uh, not too, too long ago, I moved to the state of Rhode Island, where I have lived before, and uh, what we find in all across the country is chemtrails are getting worse. And here in Rhode Island, every day that the sun comes up and the sky is blue, uh, as soon as it is daylight, the chemtrails start coming across the ecliptic, which is the apparent path of the sun and the moon in the sky from our perspective. And what we find is that the real problem at hand is that the majority of the population here in my country uh, are asleep, fast asleep, living in a complete hypnotized state where they don't understand that what's going on above their head is not normal. And to make things worse, um, informing people is not possible. Although I will say that there are many more people catching on uh, than there were when I first started doing this. The ecliptic, that's really interesting because that's just that just clicked for me so so the ecliptic is is how the moon and the sun rise and set is that correct right it's the apparent path of the sun and the moon from our perspective so when we look up in the sky um, and people will notice that the moon's not exactly straight in line with the sun you know when you look many times of the year it's kind of a wide band but you know it's basically from east to west where the planets the sun the moon appear to travel through the sky um, can I be bold enough to ask why you feel they might be uh, mimicking that movement on, in the sky? Well, I think the first part is it's pretty clear they're blocking sunlight. Um, they're blotting out the sun. I've filmed this for years now. Um, but additionally, uh, there seems to be a real effort on to block the sunrise and the sunset. And uh, for those who have paid attention online, you'll see a lot of people claiming uh, Nibiru, Planet X is being seen at these times, um, which for me is is not not possible. There is no Planet X. There is new, no Nibiru. Um, these ideas have been around since I was a kid. It's like the planet that's always on the way and never gets here. I think what's probably going on is they're hiding things that we can detect at these times of day and. For a while there, there was quite a bit of footage coming out where people thought they were looking at Nibiru or another planet, and it almost looked like there was two suns. I think what may be going on, and I do have some footage at this point, um, I just haven't released it yet, 
But I think what might be going on is that we're seeing a reflection of sunlight off something up there, and it gives the appearance of two suns or another body. Crow's very famous for something called the lunar wave. Now, Crow, it's my understanding, I was speaking to David Weiss uh, from uh, deep inside the rabbit hole, and uh, we both came to the conclusion that you're not stating that the lunar wave is anything in particular. You're just stating that there's something happening to the moon and it needs to be investigated. So, so what's your position on the lunar wave right now? Um, currently, um, I've reached a point where when people shoot the lunar wave, I'll check it out. I don't try to vet it or verify it anymore as I think people kind of need to get involved in this and do work independent of me um, and have it kind of be an organic thing that gets out into the community. I will say that the lunar wave that I filmed in 2012 was kind of the beginning of the research that brought me to make the statement that the moon is not a rock in space um, and that the moon emits its own light. Well, that's really interesting because you've also made quite a big announcement in in in, in the last few few, few uh, days to a week haven't you that there's been a development with your some of your research is there not well from where i'm sitting it's it's not really much of a change i've been looking at this idea for at least 2 years um, and I try to get to a point where I'm very comfortable saying what I'm going to say because to the average year, people are going to think it's outlandish and that there's no merit. So I usually take my time. When I came to announce that, it, in my view, this, the moon was not a rock in space and that it's not the distance we've been told, which is true of the sun as well, um, I, I, did, I sat on that for a long time, gathering evidence, doing ancillary research that was unrelated to, you know, per se, looking through the telescope. But what I announced earlier this week was that I think it's quite likely that space is actually liquid um, water, for lack of a better term. Well, that is pretty amazing stuff because um, have you come across the, the, the rocket launch um, that the, the went up for 70, I think, 73 miles and then it stopped at the outer edge by itself? Um, I, right. I, have, I don't know if you've seen that, but um, that the, there's quite a lot of conversation um, around the fact that there's some form of firmament uh, over the planet, whatever you call it. You know, I don't know if you're going that far, but but what's your evidence to suggest that um, space is a liquid form? Well, for those who have viewed uh, my lunar wave footage, and you know, there's actually two people just sent me uh, more footage of lunar waves that other people had shot. Um, I haven't had time to really, well, actually one guy did send me, uh, what's his name? The name of the gentleman who just sent me footage is Barney's Moon Video Channel, B-A-R-N-E-Y, Barney's, so it's plur plural, apostrophe S, Barney's Moon Video Channel, and it looks to be a lunar wave. I haven't had time to vet through it. Um, but if you look at the wave footage, it does give the appearance of liquid. And this had always been on my mind for a long, long time. But I did a lot of ancillary research, um, even to do with language, you know, how, and it, this may seem simplistic to folks, but there's so much of it. Um, it's just one more little piece that fits in. Even our language about space, um, we're told space is a vacuum, yet you hear words like spaceship. You don't call an airplane a ship, you call it a plane, but these supposed spacecraft are space ships. When you get into space, you're floating. Well, how can you float on nothingness? And this is just one small little side mention that demonstrates that even the language is backing this idea. And of course, for the religious people out there, even if they're not Christian, uh, there's many religious traditions that state uh, there is some kind of a firmament separating waters from waters. The flat earth community uses the word dome. And I have said now for I don't even know how long that there is absolutely a hard, fast boundary between our atmosphere and what is called space uh, that prevents anything from going there, including machines. So men, machines, um, nobody's going above a certain distance. And I did see the go fast rocket launch quite a while ago. And, uh, and realized that if, in fact, it was genuine, uh, it was quite telling. Because what we see is a camera mounted on the outside of a rocket. I think the claim is it went 73 miles. 
um, it's spinning and it's looking back down at Earth as it goes up. But it gets to a certain height and you just hear this boom and it quits going forward and it quits spinning and it starts falling back. And there are people now, uh, actually a guy who I will have on my podcast, Crow 777 Radio, um, who is a mechanical engineer who did work on how how what speed the rocket falls back and he's doing all kinds of things. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that there is some kind of a boundary there. Uh, we just don't know enough yet to really talk about it in detail. Well, again, very interesting. <laughs> Fascinating, really, because I was watching uh, Jeff Williams, the epic interview in space. It's, it's themed. He's on the International um, uh, uh, Space uh, Ship, isn't he? The ISS. <laughs> oh, the, the ISIS? The ISIS hoax? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so... It, I mean, it looks... For, when I'm watching the video footage of... Um, uh, Jeff Williams talk back to planet Earth. It looks very realistic, you know. But then again, so did uh, Stanley, Stan, Stanley Kubrick's uh, version of uh, la- landing on the moon. Um, but it's but, but that is all false, isn't it? Yeah, there's there's no human beings in what is called space. Space has been lied about and misdescribed. So uh, we are basically babes in the woods scrambling to try to put some kind of an accurate picture together of not only what our world looks like, but what a planet is, uh, what the distance of the sun and moon are from us. And, you know, all, all this work, you know, basically if you look at it, with a logical eye over a long period of time, you'll quickly understand nobody went to the moon. When you begin to understand that that is true, um, you start to take a wider view. Why would they have done that? And then when you get to the ISS video, um, anyone with a critical research mind can quickly rip apart to show that it's false. But The real problem is becoming, uh, for those who watch movies as an example, the movie Gravity is a good example. If you had never been told that that was a Hollywood movie and you were told that that was actually footage from space, you really couldn't tell the difference. It's that good. And so we are getting to a point where simply reviewing the false constructs about space that we're handing gets more difficult by simply reviewing video. But the truth is these guys are sloppy. Um, all these hoaxes that get put in front of us die under the weight of their own details. But there is, we are getting to a point where the technology will make it very difficult to take footage and, and rip it apart as easily as we have to this point. I'm interested in what's accurate. I'm interested in painting an accurate picture and trying to learn what has been denied uh, most of the people of this world. So currently, you know, I say... The moon's not the distance, we've been told. And I'm not too worried about having to reverse that. But when it comes to the lunar wave, you know, I started by trying to describe it, not having the language I needed by saying it's a hologram. That became problematic because people dug into the technology of holograms. So I changed it and I said, well, it's a facade. And then that became problematic because then the whole thing became, well, a facade covers something. What's behind it? And, you know, if there is something behind it, that's unknowable right now. And so what I've come around to saying now is that the moon is not a rock in space and it generates its own light. So I keep having to update what I have come to understand is probably correct in a way, in the best way I can, not having the proper language to do so. What's your position on the flat Earth? conversation um you know i I don't want to deride any group but i say publicly all the time that joining a group in this day and age is a big mistake um i think the people who are going to add the most information as we rip apart the old constructs that have been lied about for so many decades maybe centuries um is individuals who go out discover and learn what they can following whatever process they want to in other words not being bound by some scientific method or whatever and then sharing it with the public and seeing if it sticks to the wall seeing if there's a there there here's the problem in the same way the internet was originally military it was called arpanet 
Um, what we were told about ARPANET was it was designed to decentralize communication. In other words, when you send an email out in this kind of construct of the ARPANET military internet that preceded what we use, um, the, the, the email goes out in 50 or 60 or 100 directions, um, you know, every which way. The packet that arrives at the destination first becomes the delivery method. So the decentralization idea was like if I was in San Diego and Reno, Nevada got blown off the map somehow with this decentralized model, uh, it wouldn't matter because the communications went all these different directions. So you couldn't just attack a certain place to stop it. Well, to take that back to human beings and groups in the flat earth specifically, if you join – a group called the Flat Earth, you have centralized what you're doing. Not only will you inherit the beliefs that are acceptable to that group, um, you will have centralized and made easy for people who want to derail the efforts to start fighting, to make you look crazy, to do any number of things to ruin the efforts of the individuals. And so when you ask me about Flat Earth as a group, I'm not interested. Now, some of the individuals in that field are absolutely contributing vital information because they are challenging the description of this world. And I have said for years now, the very place we live, this world, has been misdescribed intentionally, as has space. That's right, it has, and that's kind of the crux of this particular conversation. What really drew, drew me was uh, when I started reading some of the content um, that you've, you, you've written in um, the blogs that you've done for other people, right? And um, one of the key areas that has been of fascination to me is music. Now, when I record music, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a musician and a producer, and um, I produce political electro-punk, but that's by the by, but I produce it at 44.1 kilohertz. So if, if we want to start to address this, uh, what it appears like now was that 1939 was a very bad year for music. Um, that was the year that the old... 432 hertz, how a leaf grows or a tree branches or how the human body is put together. So the 432 is in step with nature. Um, back in 39, it was finally successfully implemented that eight cycles a second, eight vibrations per second would be added to make it 440, which has a negative effect on living organisms and actually incites uh, emotional levels in human beings, among other things. Um, and the crazy thing is this was done by uh, the Rothschilds, the banking cartels. Uh, if there was such a thing as Nazis, they were involved, Goebbels, I think, and other people. Uh, and in the early days of all this, we had things like RCA, the earliest kind of music companies that were all co-opted by the military in World War II. Well, what no one really realizes is when all this weaponization of music occurred – um, after World War II, I guess people, most people assume that places like RCA became just normal private companies again, and that's really not the case. They never stopped being this kind of military-influenced, weaponized music corporation, for lack of a better term. So what are your personal mu musical tastes? Well, it's a sad thing. Um, this is the problem with with becoming aware or what people like to call waking up in the modern age. Um, you build a life over however many years you are old. This is why it's so difficult for older people to wake up because they've spent more years building what they consider a normal day to be than younger people. Um, for In my case, uh, I was playing guitar, I think, in the summer of sixth grade, um, worshipping Jimmy Page. I ended up in a punk rock band when punk rock became a thing in the United States. Um, there was a point in time where I probably could have told you just about anything about any band from the eras of music I was in, interested in. Well, during the course of my younger adult life, when I came to realize what all this is about, um, it hurts because I can't look at music in the same way. I can't appreciate it in the same way. And to be honest with you, I really don't listen to it uh, for entertainment anymore because it is, in fact, a co-opted portion of the system of deception with which we live in. And uh, I think you're going to end up referring to one of the articles I wrote for THC where I delve into, um, you know, these 
very famous musicians like Jimmy Page, Paul McCartney, Elton John working for the Queen. They're knighted. So, you know, here's these musicians working for the royal crown. Um, but anyhow, I think I wandered a bit there. No, no, you didn't actually. That's actually perfect. And, and you are right. I, I have read that article at THC, the, the, the Higher Side Chats, which is, if you haven't checked it out, guys, go check it out. It's absolutely fantastic uh, YouTuber, um, YouTube account. Um, and because I, I, I grew up with the Beatles, okay? I grew up with a White Album, Revolver, the whole shebang, vinyl. Uh, me and my brothers, we were all into the Beatles and the Stones. Um, but but right. my, my legend was, was you know, like, like you, it wasn't Jimmy Page, but it was John Lennon. You know, I, 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 I wanted to be John Lennon. <laughs> um, uh, but but th there's a whole story around the Beatles, isn't there? Um, you know, they were the first big manic band um that, that, that took over the world really but but you have some clear insights in in what happened with the Beatles don't you well sure you know it's you know a lot of people will be hurt listening to what I'm about to say and it's it's not my intention to hurt anybody but it is my intention to state what's going on and people do remember Beatlemania and they think it was just a thing but that was an early experiment with the weaponizing of music, uh, what was happening to these girls, basically. They weren't even young women. They were girls uh, that were urinating on themselves and basically completely freaking out um, because the Beatles were playing music. But they were not the first to do this. If people remember, uh, there was another guy called the King, Elvis Presley, who's kind of manager, the guy who ran Elvis – who had a weaponized name, Colonel Parker. So for some reason, he has a military rank um, as his nickname. But there was a trampling that happened uh, in the Elvis years, which was an earlier kind of Beatle mania, Elvis mania, where supposedly a girl got killed or something. But there's actually precedence to that, too, because in the 1700s, there was a man named Paganini. And so many of my guitar heroes were always talking about him, so when I played guitar at a young age, I went and learned some Paganini and read up on him. So even back in the 1700s, uh, Paganini was playing what's called the Devil's Interval. And people who are familiar with blues music will understand what that's about. You can go look it up to understand if you want to. But playing what was termed the Devil's Interval back then in his musical scales recorded, created a similar hysteria. But fast forwarding back to the 60s and the Beatles... Um, what was going on there was these four kids were being thrust out and made to look like these superstars who are creating this great music. And I can demonstrate to you that really any logical person will come to understand that probably the Beatles had very little to do with writing the music. Um, but to get back to it, uh, as I was doing research for the article you referenced, um, I came across these newspaper clippings from back in the day where Israel refused to let the Beatles in to their country, and they cited that there was no musical value or entertainment value to what the Beatles were doing and that it was purely inciting riots. And they were not alone in this. There were other newspaper clippings where governments, local or national, in you know varying degrees, knew damn well what was going on and that they were manipulating people with emotion uh, through the music, through the weaponization of music. But so people can better understand, um, I think it's pretty common knowledge now that the Paul McCartney that we all saw in pre-1966 is not the Paul McCartney you're looking at today. And for those of you who understand and kept up on the Beatles, you know that the Beatles didn't tour anymore live to the public after 1966. So whatever happened to the original Paul, there was a new Paul brought in. Um, so many people can look at this, and unfortunately on YouTube it gets into the crazy mill, and there's a lot of things said about it. But it is in fact true that the original Paul McCartney is not the Paul that we see now. Um, there's actually plenty of footage, and actually I just did a prediction recently when Ringo Starr was inducted into the Hall of Fame by Paul McCartney, or the guy we call Paul McCartney, William Campbell is his real name. Um, I predicted that Ringo would say some things, and uh, he did, in fact. 
uh, when Paul was inducting him, when he got the mic, he said, well, some of the things Paul said were true. And actually, anyone can go back and look at Ringo Starr's induction. And if you pay attention to what's being said, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The reason I was able to make the prediction that something like that would occur is because when they opened the Vegas show, which I've forgotten the name of, that has to do with Beatles music, uh, Ringo and Paul were there. And Paul McCartney was all over this interview. I forget whether it was 60 Minutes, some big national interview. And uh, Ringo Starr basically at one point says something to the effect of, what about me? I was actually there. Um, and there's a litany of these things. There's even footage of George Harrison and John referring to Paul McCartney as Beetle Bill. Anyone can look these things up. But to get on with it, the Beatles didn't tour anymore after 66 when the original Paul was gone. Now, here's the rub. When you listen to most of the Beatles music we all grew up with and love, um, most of that was written after 1966. As a matter of fact, if you listen to pre-66 Beatles music, there's a noted difference. Uh, the music gets much more sophisticated. Of course, the eight track and the four track are coming into play and they can, you know, make a, a much more varied recording than they could prior. But you, a four piece band could not possibly play the music that was written at that time when they were no longer touring. And it was not possible for any four piece band to play that music until the inception of pre-recording and synthesizers and that's like Beatlemania the band and other tribute bands can now play those songs because they have devices that will allow them to play multiple parts at the same time but it does beg the question which one of those 20 year old kids was writing all the orchestration and all this and you know some people will try to defend against what I'm saying here by saying well clearly it was the fifth Beatle George Martin the point is is the Beatles were used as a device to have an effect in the age of deception with weaponized music and a measurable effect across a world population. And so if you go back with a clean slate in your mind and start to review some of the things I've mentioned here, you'll begin to see. And when you come to understand that Paul McCartney was literally swapped out, um, you start to have to ask questions like how many George Harrisons were there? I mean, we just don't know, but it does demonstrate that the powers that be can take a person who is known in every corner of this world and swap them out right in front of your eyes. And there's even, you know, medical doctors who have verified that the, the Paul we got in the second, the, the replacement Paul was taller than the first Paul. His facial features were different. And there's even, you know, plenty of images that show the plastic surgery scars when Paul's covering up with a beard. But anyhow, that was kind of long winded. What a great response. Yeah, just going back to the devil's chord, isn't that the augmented fourth or flat and fifth, I do believe, something like that. And uh, yeah, there's a massive conversation going on about Paul McCartney um, in, the, in the left field and loads of accusations. Um, and uh, I think there's, uh, you know, suggestions within some of the albums um, that, that Lennon and the boys did uh, uh, that, that Paul wasn't the, the rightful Paul. He wasn't the the real man go on no I, I mean there's even it's some of this is hard to verify but we know in fact that the original paul is i mean anyone with eyeballs can go look in the way we can in the modern age at the images that we have pre-66 to what we have later and there's plenty that show he got taller all of a sudden than he ever was um but that's not even really the issue um the issue is is it possible for the whole world to be looking at the foremost popular people on the planet and have one of them be swapped out. And I'm here to tell you it was absolutely done in front of your face. As a matter of fact, some of the images where they've got a Paul uh, in a beard, um, you will you can see the scars on his chin and his lip and in other places from where the plastic surgery is going on. Um, but the, the, the real kind of crazy thing is uh, I had a friend who was big into the music and he many, 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 many years ago, he came to understand that you know, there was that fraud had occurred and he began to do research and started to point out that it was being reflected in the music uh, in Sergeant Peppers when they're saying, you know, we want to introduce to you the one and only Billy Shears. Um, he said it was a play on the words Billy's here and Billy Shears, which was a play for William Campbell and claimed and I he may well be right that the image of Paul 
a guy that looks like Paul is, in fact, William Campbell before he became the Beatle. It was put right into the album, along with all the other encoding that went into the cover of that album. Um, it goes on and on and on. But whether or not you choose to kind of follow these minuscule details that so many people get hung up on, there's really no denying that the guy we look at now is not the guy that started with the band. And it's so important because it's uh, an example of the level of the deception that w within which we live on a day-to-day -day basis or we choose to or I choose to engage with. Because uh, just going back to Paul McCartney, I think he actually is rumored that he died in a car crash uh, when he left the studio at some point uh, early on. But, the, but the, 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 this ability for the elite to deceive us and to, and, and to push our, our uh, attention into a certain area has not gone away anywhere because we're seeing the same with um, uh, Barack Obama, who's, who's nothing more than a puppet, and his wife, who's clearly not uh, a, a girl. He's, uh, he's yeah, Michael. Pro pro yeah, she's probably, probably not yeah, because... female. But, but you know what's crazy about the Beatles thing, too, is it really kind of demonstrates how the majority of us are treated like monkeys, like just retarded monkeys. Um, there was actually a contest after the death of the original Paul. There was a contest that was done, and there's evidence to show this. People can look it up. They were going to have a Paul McCartney, or a, I think it was just a Paul McCartney lookalike, or may have been a Beatles lookalike. I forget, but they had a lookalike contest, and they did this, and then there was no outcome to it, and this was all going on as they were looking to make the replacement. But my friend who had delved into this so deeply um, had actually made contacts, and he claimed that songs like um, I've forgotten the name. You've got to admit it's getting better. It's getting better all the time. What he came to tell me was that they were had found the new Paul. The surgery was going on to change his look. Uh, they weren't touring live. He was hidden off in uh, Ireland or somewhere. I forget where it was. Um, but he was a right-handed guy that was being forced to learn how to play an instrument left-handed. And apparently he didn't sing so well. And the claim that my buddy made who did so much research on this was that that song is, is the other Beatles saying, um, you're getting better. You're, you know, we've got to admit you're getting better. You're getting better all the time. And that's just one example of a litany of the songs uh, where they were actually just, you know, playing in your face, doing whatever they wanted and uh, assuming that most of the population is basically just dim-witted. That's right, and it, it, that song is actually titled "Getting Better." <laughs> I think it was on the nineteen sixty eight, the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. I, I, yeah, I, I, I can't remember, um, but it, it, it's fascinating. Um, but this is the top level stuff. So, can, can you go? Well, and look let, let, let me let me cut for a second before I forget. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there's there's actually a lot more to this than meets the eye. Um, all these threads of deception are interconnected. And so when we look back through the history we can verify, you and I can remember the Beatles so we know it happened, they formed a corporation called Apple, right? So if we look at that logically, we can state categorically that that corporation named a Apple changed the entire world. Can we agree on that? Oh boy, yes we can, yeah. So now fast forward it, there was a time when the Beatles apparently, we were told, would not allow their music to be played on iTunes. So from the public perception, there was this lawsuit going on between Apple Records, Apple Corporation, and Apple Computer, you see. Now there is a game being played here, a spell being cast. We're looking at the first Apple, which was the Beatles, and they changed the world, every corner of the world. And now we fast forward to Apple, the computer company, where there is some bizarre kind of dark link and spellcraft at play, which has changed the world so much more than that original Apple did. And in the public eye, they have even taken the effort to stage this fight where the old Apple Records is suing the new and, you know, all this shenanigans going on. If you're a logical person and you care to take the time at that thread I have just laid down on the table, you might be stunned when you start to see things. So why would 
uh, Apple Records and uh, the Apple Corporation um, but, stage. It's, it's all from the same playbook. These things don't happen in the way that the public is told. It's like 9-11. Those buildings were built with the intention that they were going to be demolished. This was a known thing. 30 years before they fell, they were built with the actual plan of the demolition to come, which was already planned for that day, for that moment in time. The spells would be cast, the calendar was written, the clock was wound, and the effect of that day, 9-11, which would again change every corner of this world, was known that it was going to happen for Lord knows how long before it did. And in the case of 9-11, you know, I just did an interview with Dave J, um, and uh, many people will know him and think he's a controversial figure. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to run that on Crow 777 Radio Podcast because he talks about how those buildings represented the temple, the mind. And when they destroyed them, well, people will just have to come listen. But you've got to understand that when the Beatles came along, it was not just four kids who had talent and, you know, this all came out of it. No, this was woven into the system of deception. Anything that has an effect on the population sizes that we see you have to understand these are not just things that happened on a whim, by good luck, by good fortune, or by chance. They are orchestrated from get-go to completion. Interesting you bring up um, 9-11 because I was on the understanding that three buildings fell at that point. But I've, I've been notified that actually seven buildings came down. And I've also been in contact with um, a guy called Michael Tellinger. Who's, out, who's the head of the Ubuntu party in, in South Africa. And um, he clearly states that cities are built very much in the format of, of generating energy. Um, but you, what you're stating is that these spells, and you know, it is common knowledge that words are spell bounding and, and that, that frequency and sound also generate some form of spells. But my question would be to you, Crow, is if these people are putting spells um, together, um, who are they and, who, and, and who, who are they casting the spell to? Well, I, I mean, in some ways that question just isn't answerable and it will never be. I mean, I hear you. you yeah. hear you hear these people talk about New World Order and Illuminati. Well, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't inform you of anything. It's just a, a word for a thing that has no definition. What we know is there's a ruling class of some kind. We assume that they're human beings. Uh, we assume that they are far advanced from what the retarded population has become due to food, water, and all the things that has been done to the majority of us. Um, but, you know, it's not really important to know who is doing this. It is much more important to know how it's done. And few people understand that the basic things that we do every day have much more significant meaning than what you've been taught in your lifetime. You and I are sitting here talking right now, which means we're generating frequencies. Um, those frequencies could be color. They could be light. They could be anything. Frequency goes across it all. But you need to look at it like this, maybe, to start to get insight. Language and spelling is magic. It is literally magic. And while you and I probably are at the lowest level of the use of this type of magic, there are people that are so adept and advanced that they may almost seem like different species of human beings. And to demonstrate why it is magic, consider this. Right now, I can implant a thought in your head that you don't want, don't plan for, but you can't stop. I'm going to do it to you right now. The blue box. I just did it to you. There was no way you could shield yourself from it. In your mind, you thought of a blue box. You thought of the color blue. You thought of a six-sided object. You thought of the cube, and there was nothing you could do about it, and I just did that to you, and I planned to do it. As a matter of fact, I not only planned to do it, I told you I was about to do it to you. That is magic. Yeah, that's and true. And yet we don't understand what can be done when you really ratchet up the effects that we've been talking about here. So if we take 9-11, they, they 
definitely pre-programmed us for 9-11. There's loads of images and conversations about the the, the uh, towers. Even in films like, I don't know, um, Le Lethal Weapon, there was references to, to a plane flying into, into towers and, so, and on, on, on The Simpsons. And, and clearly, when, when you stated that to me right then, I thought of a box and I thought of a blue box and I had a picture in my mind. So I am being, and I talk about this quite a lot, that Hollywood and the TV, the programming is a is a form of um, uh, predictive modeling. That's the term I use. And, and so why were the Beatles introduced? What was the Beatles um, specific role, do you think? Well, I mean, look what they did to an entire generation. Um, basically, what came out of that, you know, we all remember the free love and the drugs. Um, maybe it was known that that generation was going to have enough youth that they were going to give the ruling class a hard time. So they drugged them all out. I mean, look at all the things, how that generation was going to change the world and look at the outcome. Basically, what happened in the end was a few hundred million people got really high and then all those very liberal, wasted, long-haired hippies became conservatives. That's what happened out of this big world-changing movement that set off to kind of make the world a better place. Well, that's really interesting because, again, I've also had um, issues with drugs in, in my years growing up. You know, um, I wanted to be a rock and roll star and I wanted to be dead by the time I was 30. Now, clearly, I got that, that programming from somewhere. And um, then, you've, you know, you've answered your own question, right? Exactly. I, I mean, if you wouldn't have had your heroes uh, being psychedelic and smoking dope and growing their hair out and being the counterculture, you probably wouldn't have modeled your life that way. But when you take that a step further and start to think, well, wait a minute, how come there, all these drugs weren't available in the 50s? Why was it all of a sudden in the 60s? Well, they were supplied. And when you think of where did all that LSD come from, as an example, Timothy Leary was like the, the head guy, you know, the, the poster boy for LSD. Well, where did he come from? He came from a university, you see. So this is all engineering. You know, this stuff is all interwoven and demonstrates how a society can be controlled and engineered, basically, from, you know, instilling hysteria with music to drugging out a few hundred million kids to Lord knows what. So do you know when they they decided to change the frequency that music was recorded? Uh, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, it was implemented in 1939. I think Rockefellers and the Rothschild banking cartels were in on it, but there was clearly a, uh, I think the Nazi Goebbels had something to do with it, if there was such a man. And it's all kind of intertwined with the banking and the war machine that ended up pushing into World War II. We're talking 1939 here, you see. So... These entertainment companies after the war, uh, I mean, here, here's a good example. In the States, we have a channel called the Turner Classic Movies. If anyone is to go and look at the, the, the lineup of movies on that, you can see how intricately Hollywood was tied to the war in uh, World War II. I mean, they were hand in hand. It's almost like Hollywood was a battalion you know, used in the war, except it was a hidden battalion and it was being used against its own people. When you go back and look how they pushed uh, the war messaging and just, I mean, there's a period of time there where the only movies they made nearly were war movies to, you know, shape public opinion. It's a crazy, crazy thing. What I'm telling you here is that all the things we take for granted in entertainment, are not here to help you. They just aren't. And I demonstrated it by implanting a blue cube in your head, telling you I was going to do it to you, warning you I was going to do it to you, poking you in the eye, saying, dude, I'm going to put something in your mind and you can't stop me. And then I demonstrated it. Now, when you extrapolate this out to very wealthy people, the most wealthy here on this world, owning these music industries, these movie industries, the television, the, you know, all this stuff, 
Now you have to ask yourself, are they just doing this to entertain us? Is that even a realistic probability? It's really not, is it? When you start to look at what's going on. And then some people might make the argument, well, it's there to make money. Well, is it? The richest among us don't need money. They will never need money. They don't have to work for money. Um, They make money for doing nothing every day of their lives. What it becomes is something other, and that other is controlling the masses. And when they say the word masses, they don't use the M in the way I do. And, of course, with um, the frequency of 44 um, kilohertz, as, as we've, we've identified earlier, there is a way of moving back to 43.2, isn't there? And you also have um, a link on that blog to that particular site that gives instructions you using a, a program called Audacity to, to go back to 43.2. Now, 43.2 kilohertz actually has frequencies of healing and peace, doesn't it? it, it can, can you talk to me a little bit about that? People should understand that once upon a time, apparently, it's before my, my lifetime, so I can't verify it you know, with my own eyes or my own memory, but music was made at 432 hertz, and it was called a verde tuning, and anyone who's familiar with Spanish or Latin-based languages understands that means green, and it relates to the Fibonacci sequence. Um, in 39, when they switched orchestral tuning, so all the orchestras around the world and pianos all of a sudden were going to get tuned at 440 to the damaging thing, um, you should understand that from 1939 forward, almost all music has been recorded and all pianos are tuned and orchestras are tuned to this damaging frequency. In the article David was referring to, there are links, uh, and you can look these up for yourself, that you can hook up to your iPod an app that will detune all your music catalog back to a more beneficial um, thing. But you see, that's, that's not the whole story here. It's one thing to try to detune back to the beneficial 432, but there is intention put into the music that we all love and grew up with. And this is the real problem because people don't understand and they think it's like talking about ghosts or demons. And unfortunately, in, in a weird way, it is kind of like talking about ghosts or demons. But nonetheless, it's true. Um, to take it to a scientific realm so people can understand, there was a Japanese man who did a study on water to see if you could embed intentions, human intentions into water. And you can look this up online. I've forgotten the gentleman's name. And actually, if I think of it while we're doing this interview, um, I will mention it. What he basically did was took water, and I think he froze it and did other things, but he would yell at it, I hate you, death, or he would take paper to the outside of the water container that said things like murder, and he would film the crystals that were produced with these intentions put into the water. Then he would do the opposite. He would say, I love you. He would put positive things, and he would film the crystals. Anyone can look this up. And what they found and proved was that intention could be embedded into the water. So now you have a demonstration of human intention being embedded into a object. This is what's gone on with music. So even when you take the time to detune your music to the beneficial 432 based on the Fibonacci sequence, you still have the problem of negative intention was embedded into a lot of the music. And people don't understand. This is why songs like Hotel California or Stairway to Heaven or Sweet Home Alabama or Desperado, these songs sound different to you. The first time you ever heard them, you thought, wow, that's a clever song. That's a great song. Um, That's a special song, but it's not what you think. There is a game being played with this music. That is why that music is different. As a matter of fact, there is a Seinfeld episode that covers exactly what we are talking about here. I think if I remember correctly, and I'll try to remember back so people can look this up, Seinfeld did an episode to slap you in the face and make fun of you using the song Desperado by the Eagles, who were just 
indirectly involved in the false flag attack in Paris because it was the Eagles of death metal that were that was the band playing there. So there was this oblique reference to them. And of course, the leader of that band just died. I mean, the Eagles. But in the Seinfeld episode, they used the song Desperado and Witchy Woman by the Eagles to show the hypnotizing spellcraft effect it has on you. If I remember correctly, it's episode 135, and I believe the name of it was The Checks, as if you're writing a check to someone. Go back and watch that episode, because it illustrates right in your face what is being done with music. Yeah, that's really powerful, man. Yeah, it's Seinfeld episode, season eight, episode seven. Um, yeah, the, the checks. Yeah, that how how that it, it's just it's frightening, and um, yeah, it's uh, Masaru Imoto who did the um, scientific experiments on water. And there water- you go. You you should really kind of. I know it's going to be hard for people to look that up, but you just did. But that is a critical critical thing because a lot of people listening are going to be thinking that I'm over here smoking peyote. And I can assure you that I'm not smoking peyote. As a matter of fact, I can assure you I haven't done anything like that since the 80s when I was a kid and my hair was a bit too long. Well, actually, my hair is a bit too long now, so I guess I shouldn't use that reference. My point is this. If you look up the gentleman that David just mentioned, it proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that the intention of a human being can be embedded into something like water or music. And that means... If a nice person wants to embed compassion, you know, it's like food. Have you ever noticed like when your mom made you food, how that tasted better than any food you ever tasted? It's because your mother's love, that key ingredient that people joke about, it's not a joke. Your mother was putting her love for you in that food that you ate and you could sense the special quality of that food. And by the same token, if someone who hated your guts made you something, I assure you it would taste nothing like your mother's food, even if it was the same recipe. I think this is such a critical point to make because most people think, oh, it's a damn Ouija board. It's ghosts. That stuff doesn't exist. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you these things do exist, and we have been taught not to understand. We've all been taught to think and understand in a very gross way. And we need to understand subtlety and we need to get away from the ways we were trained. So there it is. I think you're absolutely spot on there, Crow. Um, you know, the, the communication, um, the verbal communication is only a, a percentage of, of, of how, how we communicate with each other. And there, there's the untold communication about body language, about just the general energy that we give off, that I give off with other people and other people give give to me. Mm-hmm. And that essence of, of, of love is in, incredible. I've seen this guy, um, Masaru Emoto, I've seen his, I've, I've done some research into water because water's a massive issue, I think, and a, a massive conversation because my body, our body, what, 75%, 70, 75% of water, we, we are basically uh, uh, made up of uh, water. Good point. Uh, and um and 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 it's very clear that this guy has changed the crystallization in in the water anyone listening to this just look it up it's absolutely fascinating well um, take it a, take it a step further david we're 75% water which means an adept at spellcraft could embed into that 75% of your body his negative intention without too much effort because all's, all's the gentleman we did that we're talking about, um, some of the things were so simple that he simply put the word love on the container or the word hate. So now think about a person who's a black magic adept. You know, now think about a person who has not been subject to drinking fluoride and eating tainted food like the majority of us are, um, to the point where some of these people we assume are almost a bit of a different species because they have always had the good food, good water, good information, important information, and it's been handed down from generation to generation in these supposed ruling families. So, you know, there it is. Boom. Absolutely fantastic stuff. And this brings me back to to your latest um, um, o- o- online investigation regarding... The, the construct of space, you know, it, 
are, are, are we realistically thinking that space is made up of uh, out of water particles? Well, you know, I uh, I've been thinking about this and researching it and uh, trying to decide if I was ever going to be to a point where I would announce it publicly. Well, I made that announcement a couple days ago that in my view, it is very likely that space is in fact liquid or water, for lack of a better word. Um, people who have seen the lunar wave footage can start to get a, a taste of where I started years ago um, when I started to draw lines. But uh, this this idea is echoed through all the major religions. Uh, people, since most of us here listening to this are probably Western world folks, um, Christianity states the firmament separates water from water. But Christianity is not alone in that assertion. Um, and to be frank, uh, for the keyed-in minds who do not watch movies and go into hypnosis for entertainment and actually can pay attention to what they're viewing, uh, there's a meme that is played over and over that is subtextually encoding the idea that space may be water. And then, you know, even in plain language, um, people are described as floating in space. Well, how can you float on nothing in a vacuum? You can't. Uh, why would you call a spaceship a ship? Why is... You know, so many like the the first space shuttle. I've forgotten that it was a Galileo, and you know, there's there's all these ships that we had on water, like the Enterprise. Um, that was originally a ship that sailed on the water. There's all these memes and encoded information, which is to the left or right of the observations I made over this whole time, and all this information including looking at movies like uh, as an example guardians of the galaxy my nephew was watching there's a scene where uh, a couple of the characters in guardians of the galaxy are outside trapped outside a spaceship it's being clearly portrayed as water um look at stargate where uh, back in i don't know was that the 80s when stargate first came out a portal opens that's going to take them to the other world and what's in the portal that they go through it's water and it was so bad that the makers of the movie took pains to carefully say that's not water. Well, I'm here to tell you that if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, that's liquid that we're looking at in the Stargate portal. So it's just all these varied avenues of things we can look at in research that have all kind of been studied over a couple of years by myself and then roundabout pulled back into all the thousands of hours of telescopic observation and combined with, you know, the information that we already know is true. Like nobody went to the moon. Rockets are not going above what we call low Earth orbit. It goes on and on. But yeah, there it is. I have come out and made the statement that I think space is likely, likely liquid. Wonderful. And uh, can I just add that um, our laws, we have laws of the land and we have laws of the sea. And when we go, into, when I've been in court, sadly I have been in court in my younger days, um, I was actually uh, looking at that now. I, I, I entered into the dock of a ship and and, uh, and 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 the judge is actually viewed as the captain of the ship, and uh, I'm being judged under the laws of the sea and not the land. It's, they're pirates. They're, they're pirates. pirates. That's right. Practicing pirates. admiralty law, they are defrauding you. They are hiding what's actually going on. As a matter of fact, there is footage online of people being well aware that admiralty law is being passed. Uh, used against them and they go up against those judges knowing what to do and there is actually footage or there was not too too long ago of a judge standing up bowing and walking out of a courtroom because the person that they are trying to prosecute beat them at their own game and at that point the person being prosecuted the average joe like you or i takes control of the court declares that the the captain has abandoned the ship and i am commandeering and dismissing the case with extreme prejudice. This is not hoodoo or, you know, hippie pipe dreams. This is real stuff. Yes, it is. And uh, that leads me to the note of uh, the, the, the point of a promissory note. Uh, we, it goes on and on and on. But, but uh, the whole banking system is set, on, uh, set up and, uh, with, with the same emphasis um and it's all pretty illegal stuff <laughs> um yeah it's, it's absolutely fascinating stuff crow um absolutely just, fascinating. Pir just pirates that took over you know their, their little pirating they did on the sea came ashore that's why a courtroom is made to look like the you know the mast of a ship the the captain's deck it's amazing and i i i had no idea i you know i'm 
I'm, you know, waking up is a process, isn't it, to, to how the world really goes on, uh, or, or how it unfolds, and it's it can be slightly uncomfortable at times, especially when I'm trying to engage with the real world and people who just have no interest. They just want to watch their TV, do their nine to five, um, have 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 a holiday in the summer and come back to the grind. Um, and and that's their prerogative. But uh, uh, what would you say to anyone as we wrap this thing up? What would you say to anyone who's 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 got this far and wants to know more about you and your work, Crow? Right? Um, if you want to find me, uh, you can find me on YouTube as Crow Triple Seven C R R O W Seven Seven Seven. If you do internet searches, you have to be careful because there is a person or group flying Masonic colors and Baphomet and satanic imagery who bought crow777.com and they're impersonating me and I'm not alone. They've done it to some other researchers in in the kind of realm that I am. And so just be careful. But I also run a podcast and that is crow777radio.com. And again, the URL crow777.com has been pirated by people who fly Masonic and satanic colors. Um, so let me be very clear. You can find me as Crow Triple Seven on YouTube. That's me, and Crow Triple Seven Radio dot com. That is my podcast. Boom! Fascinating stuff. Thank you for your time. Keep up the fantastic work. I, I'm uh, I'm su- subscribed to to your work, and I check in weekly. And I just want to you know say thanks, man. Thanks for the information. Thanks for the integrity, and um, may may um, may you and your family be well. Until we speak next time. <laughs> Strange days indeed, man. Indeed. Cheers. Have have a good evening. Thanks, pal. Bye.